Welcome once again to this online worship service at Christ Alone Lutheran Church in Mequon and Thienesville, Wisconsin. On this weekend of November 19th, we are continuing our look at that time in between, between Christ's first coming and his second coming. And it's a special time for us today, especially focusing on what are we doing during this time. The Lord has much to say about that. Let's begin today by singing our opening hymn, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
we join in the prayer of the day. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1, as the Lord calls his Old Testament people to repent and to bring forth fruits of faith as they expect his return. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, as the Lord calls us to a life as living sacrifices. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The Word of the Lord. We acclaim today's gospel. Alleluia. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Alleluia. Today's Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, beginning at verse 14, Jesus' parable of the talents. This will also serve as the focus for today's sermon. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, 
and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant! So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Our hymn of the day is, Rise My Soul to Watch and Pray. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, were you scandalized by today's gospel? Were you confused by the parable Jesus told? Were you frightened, perhaps, when Jesus said, whoever has will be given more, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them? Speaking for myself, 
The parable of the bags of gold has always struck me as odd. We all know that God's grace is free. We don't earn or deserve it. So doesn't Jesus' parable present a kind of distorted view of salvation? When the faithful servants are congratulated and rewarded for doubling their master's money, Jesus seems to suggest we can do something for our salvation. And again, when the master condemns the third servant for being wicked and lazy because he didn't gain any returns, how does Jesus want us to understand this parable? What separates the faithful servants from the lazy servant? Perhaps the most obvious answer to that question would be that the faithful servants earned more than the lazy servant. The faithful servants each double the initial amount they're given. The lazy servant only buries it in the ground, neither gaining or losing anything. That was basically the equivalent of taking your money and hiding it under your mattress. What the good servants did, you could think of as starting a small business or investing in the stock market. The master even says to the lazy servant that he should have brought the money to the bankers so he could at least get it back with interest. That's just common sense. It's better to get a small, guaranteed amount of interest than to just have a pile of cash. So, we can conclude that more profit is better, right? However, Jesus makes it clear that earning more isn't really the factor that sets them apart. In the first place, the way the master refers to them isn't based on how much they earned. It's Faithful servants versus lazy servant, not money-doubling servants versus money-returning servant. The master only makes the point about the bankers to show the lazy servant's excuse is just that, an excuse. The lazy servant has described the master as a harsh person, reaping where he did not sow and gathering where he did not scatter seed. In short, pursuing profit at all costs, even by questionably legal means. If the servant really believed this about the master, he would have done something with the money to earn even a tiny profit. But he hasn't done so. His explanation is really just an excuse. So, what sets the faithful apart from the lazy? From the way I phrased that question, you may have realized that it has to do with faithfulness and laziness. Earning more or less is just a symptom of the difference, not the difference itself. While the servant's excuse is still fresh in your mind, though, I want to talk about it a bit more. The way he speaks of the master as harsh tells us something about his attitude. And as we apply the parable, about the way this kind of person views God. It sounds like the lazy servant would argue the master isn't fair in entrusting his possessions to his servants. Perhaps he views the master as too demanding. Perhaps he doesn't want to bear the responsibility. So also, there are some who would argue that God isn't fair that he's too strict in how he judges, that he's harsh or cruel in how he deals with us humans. You may think you would never view God that way. But wait just a minute. Are there situations where you might be tempted to think that way? Take, for example, the unbeliever who's never heard the gospel. Is God justified in condemning that person? Many say no that it would be contrary to God's love and grace. A loving God, they say, wouldn't send someone to hell without at least giving them a chance to believe in him. When we dig down, we can see that this sort of reasoning flows from the false idea that God owes us something. 
It forgets that God would be justified in condemning us all. God doesn't owe us anything. Grace is what's unfair, not condemnation. So if there's any unfairness in God, it's in our favor, not against us. Okay, so what separates the faithful from the lazy is not the amount of profit, but maybe it has to do with their activity. Maybe it's that the faithful servants did something while the lazy servant did nothing. That would explain the labels of faithful and lazy. Faithfulness implies some sort of activity. For example, for me to be a faithful student means to complete my assignments on time, to study for tests, to pay attention in classes. Put yourself in the shoes of the lazy servant. The three of you stand there receiving your master's possessions as he prepares to set out on a journey. What's going through your head? This is a big responsibility. This is a lot of money. More money than I could save in my entire life. So, what are you going to do? Obviously, hiding the money was not what the master had in mind. If that were what the master wanted, he could have done it himself. Yet, you think to yourself, hiding it won't be wrong, because this way, he's guaranteed to get his money back, you think. Trying to put the money to work, that could be disastrous. You could lose everything. And so the servant rationalized a path that, by complete coincidence, of course, didn't require more than the bare minimum of effort from him. And as he stood before the master and his wickedness and laziness were uncovered, it was too late for him. As he heard his master proclaim that punishment, throw that worthless servant into the outer darkness. At the end of the day, it's true that all three servants received an enormous trust, but only one of them did nothing, was content to do nothing with that trust. But there's more to it than just doing something versus doing nothing. What heart condition led the third servant to avoid doing anything with the money? The symptom of the disease of sin that Jesus diagnosed in the parable wasn't simply the laziness of the servant. Rather, it was the attitude. Like in our first reading, Jesus indicts the hypocrites, those who think the mere outward action is what God cares about, those who think that simply going through the motions will get them right with God. That was the attitude Jesus was constantly dealing with in the Pharisees and teachers of the law. That was the sort of service the lazy servant provided. And it flowed from a wicked rejection of the master and his gifts. The difference between the faithful and lazy servants was that the faithful ones trusted their master, while the lazy ones did not. Jesus teaches that where there is genuine, saving faith, good works will follow. He calls to you with this parable to be faithful with the means of grace and to be busy in his kingdom with the gifts he has given you. So what does that look like? It's the readiness to volunteer where you can for church events, to help with setting up or cleaning up. It's attentiveness to what happens in worship, the prayers, the readings, the sermon, the sacrament. It's the willingness to be kind and patient with other members of the body of Christ whose behaviors may vex you. In short, it's the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul writes in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you're feeling convicted at this point, you're not alone. 
None of us meets the standard of faithfulness that God sets. All of us have been short with someone, had our minds wander during church to what we're doing later in the day, taken the attitude that someone else will volunteer. It's not my job. All of us deserve to be thrown into the outer darkness along with that wicked servant. So, what comfort is there when you're confronted with your unfaithfulness to God, to Jesus? Paul once wrote to Timothy, If we are faithful, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Your unfaithfulness will not cancel out Jesus' grace and mercy. He deals with you gently and patiently, not wanting anyone to perish. That's why, week after week, he comes to you through the words of his called servant to proclaim, I forgive you all your sins. What comfort is there? The comfort that Jesus is the vine, you are the branches. All your life flows from him. In him you bear much fruit that will abide. Apart from him, you can do nothing. What comfort is there? The comfort that we have nothing we didn't receive. We can't take credit for our faith any more than we can blame God for our stumbling. The servants couldn't take credit for the bags of gold entrusted to them. They didn't earn them. Nor could the lazy servant blame the master for his wicked rejection and attitude towards him. What comfort is there? The comfort in the words of the master, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. You have the gospel. You have the means of grace. And Jesus has even more in store for you. He has a room prepared in heaven for you. As he said, I am going there to prepare a place for you. So, how to answer that question? What separates the faithful from the lazy? On the one hand, the lazy servant's excuse illustrates his wicked rejection of the master and his gifts. That rejection corresponds to unbelief. On the other side, the faithful servants are those who have their master's gifts. Those gifts are all grace, not something they earned. They don't view the gifts as a burden, a heavy, oppressive load, but as a joyous treasure. What separates the faithful from the lazy is their trust in the master, Jesus, as opposed to the lazy who distrust him. The faithful joyfully receives his gifts, whereas the lazy view his gifts as a burden. You have that awesome treasure, that beautiful gospel truth, that salvation depends not on what you do, but on what Jesus did for you, on his merit, his perfect life and death for you. Value that faith you've been given. Cling to those words of absolution, your sins are forgiven. Live in the grace of baptism. Come to the Lord's table and receive his very body and blood given and shed for you on the cross. Connected to Christ, rooted in him, you bear good fruit. And because you have his gifts, look forward with confidence to your master's return. Let us be busy in God's kingdom until that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
confess our Christian confidence in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We join now our hearts and voices in praying the prayer of the church. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear our voices. Let your ears be attentive to our cries for mercy. Heavenly Father, we confess with sorrow that we have sinned and deserve only your anger and punishment. If you kept a record of our sins, we would surely be lost. We confess with joy that your unfailing love has redeemed us. Our hope is in you and in your full redemption. Around us we see the birth pangs of the last days, war, famine, earthquakes, false prophets, spiritual apathy. Use these signs to remind us that we do not know the day or hour when Christ will come again. Keep us faithful to your word. Send your spirit to strengthen our faith so that we are always prepared for your son's return as judge. Make us faithful in sharing your word and cause many more to put their hope in you before the end comes. Use us, our special gifts and unique abilities to work hard in your kingdom to attract others to the light of your gospel of salvation. Bless the labor of our church family. Let us work while it is day, before the time comes when no one can work. Heavenly Father, we eagerly wait for Jesus to come back and make all things new. May he find us, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, faithfully enduring to the end, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, may your grace be with us, Amen. And in Jesus' name we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go now in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you peace. Amen. We close by singing The Church's One Foundation.
So glad you joined us today. I pray that this hour has been a time of spiritual upbuilding for you as you await the coming of your Lord. Thank you so much for your support of this ministry too, uh, whether it's financially or whether it's by sharing these videos with others. We're glad for the spread of his kingdom as we look forward to seeing him face to face. God richly bless you as you continue to look to his coming.